Economic fears and the Ukraine conflict cast a shadow over the World Economic Forum. Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Hello again. Ukraine, rising prices, fears of a global recession, the ongoing pandemic and signs that governments aren't doing enough to fight global warming made for quite a gathering of political and business leaders over the past weekend in Davos, Switzerland. Inflation has undermined consumer confidence and shaken the world's financial markets, prompting central banks to rapidly raise interest rates and food shortages brought on by the Russia-Ukraine conflict have led to what the United Nations calls a global food security crisis. There is a lot to talk about. Let's get straight to our panel. Gilson Schwartz is the uh, economics professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Welcome. Victor Gao is, of course, a friend of the program and chair professor at Suchow University. Also with us is Anton Feliashin. He's a Russian affairs analyst and history professor at American University, also a good friend of the show. And Anthony Chan served as managing director and chief economist at J.P. Morgan Chase. Guess what? We're talking about Davos. So I'm going to start with the banker. Anthony, how are you? Um, is the um, champagne at uh, Davos a little uh, less vintage this year? Is the caviar being replaced with fish eggs uh, of a different variety? Is there a, a, a cloud over the great and the good and the very rich? There definitely is uh, somewhat of a cloud. Uh, we know that last year, global economic growth was growing in excess of 6%. And this year, we're probably going to see global economic uh, growth uh, basically cut in half from what you saw uh, occurred last year. So this year, there is a little bit less optimism. Uh, we have central banks uh, fighting inflation, and historically, when you do that, you tend to slow economic growth because that's what mm. central banks can do. They can lower aggregate demand in the hope and expectation that they would lower prices. So with uh, central banks in many parts of the world raising short-term interest rates, uh, the outcome is likely to be slower growth. The risk, of course, is that some central banks may go too far and cause recessions. And that's something that is on the minds of a lot of people in Davos today. I just a just quick follow-up, because I think this is important to get to the top. Do you think the likelihood of recession is higher than one of a so-called soft landing, where you kind of may slip into negative growth contraction for a quarter or two, but essentially you escape the pain of a recession? Well, I think that the risk of, uh, of a recession varies by geographical area. If you look at uh, Europe, for example, because they're a lot more vulnerable to energy than the United States, Most I think now, that the yeah. risk of recession is higher. But in the U.S., economic growth is slowing, and not necessarily in 2022, but as you go into 2023, uh, there is greater risk in Europe of a recession. But at the same time, there is significant risk that the U.S. can also slip into a recession in 2023. Uh, and perhaps that is why you're hearing some rhetoric from central bankers in the United States that they may decide to may perhaps be a little bit less aggressive than the market is thinking as they look towards year end. Yeah, good point. I, I want to just uh, bring on a Anton in a minute, but I, first of all, want to obviously underline the fact that this Davos is also being overshadowed by uh, the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, what with oil prices, of course, the uh, problems with food security. Let's just listen to uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, president of the European uh, Commission, and I'll get your reaction off the back end. We are witnessing how Russia is weaponizing its energy supplies. And indeed, this is having global repercussions. Unfortunately, we are seeing the same pattern emerging in food security. Global wheat prices are skyrocketing, and it's the fragile countries and vulnerable populations that suffer the most. Well, Anton, first of all, I just want to say I don't know a major uh, energy producer that hasn't at some stage weaponized <laughs> its energy, but uh, your reaction, there is a sort of sense of doom and gloom there, and also this Iron Curtain 2.0 descended on Europe. Yes, very much so. Um, 
uh, what you just played from uh, Ms. von der Leyen is uh, no surprise. Um, this is the former uh, Minister of uh, Defense of uh, Germany and a hawk, and so she yeah. sees everything in terms of black and uh, white. Um, I would draw our viewers' attention to two other figures, both of whom spoke um, at, the, at the forum, and both of whom represent really radically different uh, views mm -hmm. on the nature of globalization. Um, neither of them deny its importance or its benefits. And these are the two patriarchs of uh, international politics. The you're going to mention elder the K word, aren't you? You're going to mention the K yeah, word. Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. The elder one is, of course, Henry Kissinger, um, uh, whose suggestion at the forum uh, uh, inspired a very strong backlash um, in certain quarters in Europe, certainly in Ukraine, who warned that two more months of this conflict and uh, Russia may be lost to the West. But uh, underlying and between the lines of the speech was really a vision of globalization as a uh, very difficult, complex process, but one that uh, is not and should not be divided into binaries. Mm. The other main voice, of course, uh, a slightly younger man at only, I think, 91 or 92 these days, and that was George Soros. Um, and his interpretation of, again, the Ukraine conflict was that uh, Russia needs to be defeated. Uh, there's no other way to settle this conflict. And again, to, to me, what's between the lines of that attitude to the, the war in Ukraine um, is a very binary vision of globalization as one of a struggle between two camps, in the case of Soros and George Biden, by the way, it is between democracies and autocracies, which, of course, is not how no, this not how conflict works. is viewed and not how globalization unfolds. But listen, this is very important because we have these two schools. Both men are exceptionally intelligent. They're very influential. But we have these two different interpretations of the future of our planet. It's very interesting that we heard both of these views represented at the forum. Yeah, I, I think you're right uh, to analyze it that way. Uh, very succinctly put, you know, we have this difference between the sort of maximalist Western approach and the sort of realistic approach of which K Kissinger was famous for. And globalization, of course, and the future of it is very, very uh, on the line here. As you said, you can have globalization with different camps. <laughs> um, but uh, that, of course, is more dangerous, like we saw in the 1930s. Victor Gao, this is a perfect opportunity to bring you in here. And I'm going to um, uh, uh, play a little clip of a, an even younger man uh, than Anton was talking about. And that's Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, who you'd think with NATO, with everything on the plate, uh, would have enough to do. But as you know, um, uh, Stoltenberg seems to think that the North Atlantic may end in Asia. So let's just uh, have a little listen to him, and I'll get your reaction off the back. Free trade has brought a lot of prosperity and wealth to all of us. But the problem is that it has a price. Because some of this trade, some of this economic interaction with authoritarian regimes is undermining our security. And then we have to choose security instead of uh, vulnerability and over-reliance on authoritarian regimes. So there we are, Victor Gao. This is the choice that NATO Secretary General puts out. It's author authoritarian or, or democracy, you kind of choose. Well, first of all, I think Mr. Stoltenberg is very wrong in his view of the world, in his view of NATO. I think NATO should be truly a defensive organization rather than offensive. And NATO should stick to its boundary, that is the North Atlantic, rather than venturing out of its home turf, because it will not be welcomed. And then the mega trend of the world today is still peace rather than war. Why? Because we are living in a completely different situation. We are living in the world dominated by nuclear weapons, and the war is not going to be funny at all. So the situation in Ukraine already pushed the mankind to the brink of the nuclear disaster, and we do not need a Secretary General of the United uh, of NATO, who fortunately is on his way out, agitating for war. I think the key for him and for NATO and for the United States and for all of us is to do our best to bring the war in Ukraine to an end as quickly as possible. Okay. In this sense, I think Dr. Harry Kissinger truly deserved 
the Nobel Peace Prize that he won several decades ago. And I think Mr. Soros probably deserve an award for currency war and for agitation for war. So we see the sharp difference because they are very different people. They are very different species, and they stand for war on the one side, as represented by Mr. Soros, or peace, as represented by people like Dr. Henry Kissinger. Well, um, uh, you're right to talk about Kessinger's uh, Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the uh, Vietnam talks, which, of course, wouldn't have happened had they not made the rapprochement with China. So all that leads back to Beijing. And just a quick follow-up before I move on. Um, what's Beijing's stance on, on, in Davos this year? Um, because, obviously, uh, COVID's still hangover. We've seen lockdowns in Shanghai, Beijing restrictions. You, uh, as Li Keqiang said, uh, there is going to be a more of a slowdown than, than uh, originally forecast. And, of course, uh, there has been domestic policies which have, let's face it, not been friendly to billionaires uh, in, uh, who are currently around in Davos. Well, China has produced more billionaires over the past few years than any other country. So in this sense, this is a very positive thing. On the other hand, any billionaire need to do their job, need to pay their taxes, and tax evading billionaires will be caught up in justice. I think China is doing the right thing, uh, encouraging more billionaires to be produced in China because of the rapid economic development, but also creating an evil playground. So people cannot get away from their tax liabilities because they are billionaires, and they should be more conscientious in doing their social responsibility and paying their due shares in taxation. I want to follow up on that. But first of all, uh, Gilson Schwartz, thank you so much for your patience. Um, how does it look from where you're sitting in Sao Paulo? Because, you know, all these issues obviously affect Brazil, one of the biggest economies uh, uh, in the developing world, with a huge reliance, of course, uh, on the world for a lot of its grain exports. But the world security, uh, food security crisis, uh, rising prices. Where does everything look, what does everything look like, rather, from where you are in Sao, Sao Paulo through the lens of Davos? Yes, I think that for the South, all these black and white narratives mm. are a little bit, uh, say, misleading, because we fail the whole crisis. We feel that as a failure of a system, not that globalization will be reversed, but there are a few novel things that could open our horizons for a reshaping, a refurbishing of the international order. And uh, unfortunately, as we know, Davos is a business meeting, and uh, we have seen over the last uh, few years that many of the leading business people in the world, they are not really in favor of, of governance, of, uh, of right. a public sphere of a, or a democratic public sphere. So I think that we lack a narrative for reconstruction, and that's the uh, main point. That's an excellent point. Can I follow up on that? Because there was a big time when, you know, uh, the likes of Jeff, uh, Jeff Bezos and others, with uh, Bill Gates, with a huge philanthropy, were considered sort of a good force in the world. But that seems to have slipped. There's this feeling that perhaps where they want to target their money shouldn't really be their choice, but perhaps experts, governments, taxation, as you say, and they haven't really delivered on some of the promises, or perhaps are focusing on, you know, getting to outer space a bit too much, rather than uh, focusing on the goodwill of, uh, of their customers uh, all over the developing and developed world. Yes, uh, there was this theory, we could tell, we could say it's a narrative that uh, with economic development, freedom and happiness and well-being would come uh, automatically. I think that we have now witnessed that the internet, the most important uh, technological revolution since the Industrial Revolution, is now uh, something of a missed opportunity. Energy, telecommunications, and artificial intelligence are very important opening tools for the future, but we don't see any discussions about that, except, let me stress, a very important point in Davos this year, that's the announcement of a mega corporate alliance for the development of the metaverse. So this is right. really important. We know that in the next couple of years, there'll be about $4 trillion in investments for the digitalization of the economy. What it seems to me is that NATO countries are now developing a strategy to create a, a certain 
a Berlin Wall, a digital Berlin Wall. The Silicon uh, This curtain, was clear yeah. since Trump. Yeah, since Trump, the, 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 the U.S. government was attacking Huawei and was, you know, questioning the, 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 the let's say, the confidence we can have in these infrastructures because they were produced or they have a Chinese technology. The same went with the vaccines. So there's all these narratives that tend to create a sense of Western confidence in a, some kind of corporate alliance that does not favor the public sphere, that does not favor diplomacy. And I think this is really uh, about missing an opportunity to use a, a technological revolution towards the well-being of humanity. Justin, I'm, I'm so glad we waited for your comments because they're extremely wise. And I want to throw one of them back uh, to Anthony Chan there. This $4 trillion fund for the metaverse. Look, I don't blame people if they want to get out of this world. I mean, it's not been a great uh, a couple of years. But the metaverse is not really the solution to mankind's problems right now. We're talking food security, of course. We are talking uh, the, the huge divisions that we are seeing in the developing and the developed world between uh, uh, wealth, uh, obviously inflation. But this is, there's more and more of a feeling from the United Kingdom to Starbucks employees to uh, people who feel that they've been left behind and are somehow not represented by the leaders that they elect or appoint. Um, is, some, is this something that can be addressed, this leadership gap, when you have all these leaders, whether it be business and, and politicians, coming together? Is there any sort of self-examination going on? Well, I think uh, these are great forums for those things to happen. As I see what happened in Davos this year, I think it fell short of that goal. I think that this year was a somber year. I think that people were a bit more reserved, uh, perhaps a little bit less confident. Uh, but again, that's to be expected, because when the economies are doing well, uh, you have the forum and opportunities uh, to really solve lofty low goals. But when all of a sudden you have a situation where the world is uh, being strangled by high inflation in the United States, 87% right. of the people feel that they are overly stressed and perhaps even f facing emotional difficulties because of higher inflation. We have labor that is very... Uh, depressed because even though wages are rising, they're not keeping up with inflation. In that kind of an environment, not only in the United States, but really all over the world, it's very difficult to tackle those kinds of, of goals when the immediate goals uh, are perhaps uh, front and center and need to be addressed uh, even quicker than those uh, uh, worthy goals. Although, you know, considering that, what is it, the top 400 people in the world own about half the wealth, you'd think that maybe they could push the needle. But some of these problems require, uh, obviously, concerted effort across nation states, multinationals, et cetera. Um, Anton, um, thanks uh, uh, for being here again. And, and let's go back to you. First of all, you know, I'd like to sort of focus on economics for a little bit. Um, big talk of the recession, as Anthony just said. Let's just listen to uh, Christa, uh, Christiana Georgieva, the uh, managing director of the International Monetary Fund. She was asked the question, are we actually in a great global recession right now? Let's take a listen. My answer is going to be not no, not at this point. It doesn't mean it is out of question. We have downgraded our projections for growth for this year in April for 143 countries. This is 86% of global GDP. And since then, in a short period of time, a little bit like the weather here in Davos, the horizon has darkened. Well, Anton, I mean, if you're a, a Brit trying to pay their heating bill or a Californian trying to fill up their gas tank, it feels like you're already in a recession, right? Yes, it does. Um, and you don't even have to be as far as California, although it does have the highest gas prices. They're pretty bad here in Washington and everyone's uh, noticing. Um, look, uh, we are in a moment, Nathan, where a uh, what would otherwise be a regional uh, conflict, God knows there have been uh, plenty of them already just in the first 22 years of this century, but this one is having massive ramifications, um, global economic ramifications. And although there are different narratives about how it started and who's responsible, and we don't have to go through all of that right now, it's irrelevant. What I do not hear terribly much of are serious attempts at finding a solution that will then 
prevent the kind of global recession which it looks like the whole world is uh, heading for. Mm. Uh, energy prices are up uh, because of uh, both sanctions and the threat of sanctions on uh, Russia. And then, of course, the knock-on effect of rising energy prices is the price uh, of uh, food and uh, the inflationary uh, experience that we're all uh, going through, especially the developed uh, world. And in the developing world, things will be uh, even worse. So the remarkable thing uh, about the Ukraine war, besides the fact that, of course, it is a tragedy for the Ukrainian people, is that it has these global ramifications. But this tendency that, again, I heard from, uh, from George Soros and people who think of this conflict in his binary terms, is that uh, the war must be won uh, at the cost of a Russian loss, um, uh, no matter what, and then we will deal with the consequences, although the situation on the ground does not promise uh, an optimistic and uh, certainly not a quick outcome, which means that the, the situation in the global south will get progressively worse over the next few months and certainly going into next winter. Uh, excellent points. Victor, um, China in the past, I'm thinking of the financial crisis, but also thinking of the last 10 years, has sort of been the engine of global growth coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. But let's face it, this has been a rocky year for China uh, in terms of it emerging from COVID. And then, of course, we saw what's happening in Shanghai and other cities, although most of the country, it, it does operate. Let's face it, Shanghai is pretty important. Um, so is China going to do what it's done in the last 10, 15 years and lead uh, the uh, globe uh, in terms of demand and supply uh, and avoid the worst recession? Or is the situation in China actually going to exacerbate it? Thank you very much. You are raising a very important question. Yes, indeed, China is facing some headwinds uh, because of the zero COVID policy. It is uh, practicing to the hilt. However, if you count from the beginning of the pandemic, starting in uh, fe February or December 2019, all the way to now, you are talking about a three year already. And overall, China is absolutely on the winning side. And the driving force for the zero COVID policy in China is because China as a country and the Chinese government in particular do not want to see the massive amount of infections or large amount of deaths because if you use on a parallel basis the numbers coming out of the United States with more than 1 million people dead, you are talking about at least 4 million people dead in China. And if you believe that the U.S. healthcare system is about double the quality mm, of point, China, yeah. you are talking about 8 million to 10 million people dead in China. We do not want to see a situation like this. And I think the Chinese government is committed to do whatever they can, leaving no stone unturned to make sure that there will be less people infected, less people dead, including okay. those people okay. beyond 100 years old. I think this represents the values that China stands for, that is saving lives and putting science first. We do not want to okay. only think about the economic cost we want to save people. So I think a lot of these headwinds is self-inflicted by China, and eventually this will be over, and China will remain a strong engine for economic development in this year as well as the years beyond. This is my confidence, and I think China will get around this corner very soon towards the end of the year, if not in the beginning months of next year. Um, excellent points. I uh, want to also talk about globalization. Of course, let's bring in uh, Gilshan Swartz here because let's face it, uh, as uh, Brazil is a member of many uh, international organizations, the BRICS countries, it's part of the G20, I'm correct, yes, uh, um, and obviously is a big exporter. Um, as is Germany, almost Brazil's like the Germany uh, uh, of Southern America. And this is what Olaf Schultz, the uh, uh, new German Chancellor had to say, and I thought this really, um, even though Germany has, has uh, gone along with the US on a lot of things, this really sort of set the tone for the difference between his view of globalization and, the, uh, and going forward than that of Washington. So let's take a listen. More economic resilience is the order of the day in this multipolar crisis-prone world. And here too, the answer must be diversification 
for politics and business alike. At the same time, we must be careful that the necessary diversification does not become a pretext for isolation, tariff barriers and protectionism. To put it bluntly, deglobalization is the wrong track. It will not work. So, uh, Gilson, no uh, deglobalization, decoupling, whatever you want to call it. Is that music to your ears? Not at all. I think that um, many of these uh, analysts and leaders, they always keep a focus on the microeconomic level or the business level. What, uh, what's happening is that we are lacking a public sphere, a global public sphere. Mm. Globalization is a success. Globalization is a, is a success. The very fact that you have a crisis, that kind of crisis that affects everyone at once, is a demonstration that we are interconnected. The problem is not one of chains, of productive uh, supply production chains, or uh, exchange uh, uh, rates, or trade agreements. The problem is that we don't have a global public sphere, and that seems to be favored by many business leaders. Let's take a look at what uh, um, the, the Tesla manufacturer has said over the last days, that ESG is fake. Uh, that he is against regulation. In short, what we see, we are witnessing, I think that's for the first time in the history of capitalism, is a, complex, a complete disconnect between business leaders and the, and the, and the, and the idea that we need public spheres, we, we need uh, public uh, narratives, we need uh, negotiation, not only uh, a kind of uh, Darwinian, Darwinian process where the strong get the, the largest uh, share of the cake. Right. We need a uh, reconstruction of the, of the notion of international order. But business leaders, I think that they are really betting on the increase of violence and diversification at the micro level, okay. while at the same time, there's no space for negotiation at all. Um, I just want to get the last word um, from Victor, because I, I wanted to pick up on a point on that. We had a speech from Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State today, which seemed to be much softer in its tone. It seemed to follow consultations with ASEAN members, a visit to Asia, and he changed his tune a little bit, saying, look, we're not asking you to choose between China and the US, we're just giving you a choice. Is this part of that that Gilson was saying, is that people don't want to choose, and is that the way forward? I think China and the United States need to get along, and there is no real prospect of a total war between China and the United States. I've been an advocate of the inevitable peace between China and the United States because China is already larger than the United States in many important respects, right. and China will be larger than the United States in all respects. And I truly believe Antony Blinken will live to see the overall size of the Chinese economy will double that of the United States by the middle of this century. Well, this is the mega trend. Well, and I think the United States will serve its own purpose okay. by coming to terms with this rather than fighting okay. against this mega trend. Well, the question is whether the US can cope with that uh, or not. <laughs> that is going to be a very interesting thing. Uh, listen, uh, everyone, Anthony, Anton, Anthony, uh, Victor, Gilson, just a really great discussion. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Nathan King, Washington, DC. Thanks for watching. See you soon.